everybody, and welcome to the Responsive Weekly. I'm Megan Donahue. I'm the content lead here at Virtuous, and today I'm joined by two very special guests, Brian Funk, our marketing manager, and Scott Richards, our director of training. And today we're here to talk about donor love, how to show it, and how to scale it so that we can bring a great donor appreciation and engagement experience to every donor. Brian, you had a great story from your previous life as a fundraiser that I'd love for you to share with our guests today. Yeah, I'd love to. And uh, first of all, just thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks for the work that you do. Really excited to be joining the Responsive Weekly this week. And uh, wanted to kick us all off with a story. I've been, uh, before I had a life here at Virtuous, I was a fundraiser by trade. Uh, loved my fundraising life and still do. And I got to work at an organization called Invisible Children. And we were trying to end a war in Central Africa. And one of our fundraising programs was we would actually bring a former child soldier to the United States for three months and we would travel the country with them fundraising and doing speaking engagements. And there was one day where I was in a school giving a speaking engagement with Juliet, my Ugandan teammate, and this young 15 year old kid who supported us, you know, he actually rushed the stage. He was crying and I just kind of put my arm around him and brought him backstage and sat down with Juliet and I, and he just opened his heart to us and he said, he told us that his sister had passed away a few months ago, and he said that hearing Juliet share her story and her experiences and what she had gone through and the work that we were doing, that it was the first time in a couple months where he felt inspired again. He felt hope, and he found purpose because he started fundraising for us, and he ended up raising thousands of dollars for the organization, and it was this switch in my mind where I realized, oh my gosh, as a fundraiser, we aren't just fueling mission-critical funding. Like we get to be a part of our donors and supporters going through really transformational change. We get to help people tap into their heart, find their passion, define what they want their legacy of their life to be. And it's a really beautiful experience that we get to share alongside our donors. So um, thanks for all that you do to share the donor love. And you're making a huge difference, not only in the missions that you serve, but in the missions of all of the supporters of your organization. We are not solely asking our donors for money. What we're doing is engaging their generosity, which is a deeply personal and meaningful thing. And that this can be transformative for donors as much as it can be for your mission and that it's important. It's also very effective. We're in a time where attention is all over the board, stuff is going on and people are looking to be engaged personally and effectively and in a way that means something to them. So donor love can really um, cover all of those bases, meaning and joy and getting things done <laughs> in an effective way. So uh, let's pull up our slides, if you wouldn't mind, Brian, slide technician of the day. Oh, so sorry, one sec. That's okay. And this is easy, I have no jobs. That's cool, we haven't even <laughs> let you talk yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, hold on one sec. <laughs> Well, while we're holding on, I'm seeing some great stuff in the chat about how people have, have connected with their donors. I saw sending cards when people become new donors, phone calls, personal handwritten notes and PSs. So it looks like if you're looking, I saw someone was looking for new ideas, watch the chat. Your fellow fundraisers, as always, have your back. So talking about why donor-centric communication is important. Uh, Scott, would you like to speak to this? Sure, I would. And, and actually, this kind of builds on something that you just said, which is, you know, what we're asking our donors to do. And if we want to be donor centric, I think it requires a shift in mindset, right? Because we still, like we talk about asking for money and gift asks, and how do you frame the ask? You know, we use the word ask all the time, which is really kind of, you know, you're a supplicant, you're, you're asking for help. And there's people who look at fundraising as, you know, a necessary evil. Right. Hey, we're an organization that exists to feed hungry kids, and it's necessary to raise money to do that. But if you switch that mindset and say, hey, I'm not asking people for money, I'm offering them an opportunity to make the change in the world that they want to make. So I'm out here saying, hey, I'm looking for people who want kids to be able to have better access to healthy food. Are you one of those people? Well, then great, I have an opportunity for you to be able to do that. And, and if we wanna look at um, current events, right? I think everybody has, there have been so many pixels written about Mackenzie Scott and all the giving that she's done over the last year with all of her Jeff Bezos money. 
But what's interesting about all of that is not just the fact that she said, yes, I'll pledge to give my money away. And by the way, I'm not waiting. I'm doing it right now. But she put together a committee and said, OK, go find me organizations like this. Go find me organizations that are doing these types of things because I have money and I want the opportunity to make a difference. Right. And, and that's really what we want to look for is to say, hey, that's that's how we can be donor centric, not. You know, people say, hey, don't talk about how cool your organization is. Don't, you know, brag and everything. Well, yeah, talk about the donor, but also frame it as we have a great opportunity where together we can make a difference. I think that's the big thing, the big key to being donor centric in your communication. Yeah, I saw Ann just said in the chat uh, that they see fundraising as a way to provide a service that the donor can't do themselves. And I think that's a really yes. interesting way to think about it of like, all right, if I want to go like feed the hungry in my city, it's probably not the most efficient or best way for me to be like, I'm going to do it alone <laughs> with my money and the stuff in my kitchen. Let's do it. Let's go. I mean, that's a lovely impulse, but it's way, way better for me to give my money and kitchen stuff to Chicago Food Depository, which can actually get it done. And I am happy to do that. So I think like you've pointed to a thing, Scott, that I think is really important is our attitude as fundraisers, not being like, I'm sorry, I have to ask you for this. And I know you hate it, then I'm asking you for money. It's an offer, it's an opportunity, it's an invitation for something that someone may really want to be part of. Brian, what do you think? Yeah, I think like the other side of this too is, is not to make assumptions about the way that our donors want to be involved. You know, like being donor centric is actually about getting to know our donors in a really heartfelt and, and personal way. And I mean, I've seen people give to organizations that I've worked for and their donation had nothing to do with our mission, actually. Um, it kind of like reminds me of another story. I guess I'm just the storyteller today, but you know, I've done a lot of peer to peer fundraising and I had an instance once where I got a, and it was random. It was a new donor. He had never donated to us before. I got a random phone call and he said, hey, one of the people fundraising for you is a school teacher and she's raised all this money for you. And I just want to show her the love by making a $10,000 donation to her fundraising page. And I was just like, what? Right. So it's like it's like taking a step back and like getting to know people and what drives them and what motivates them and what they care about. And donors might really care about your mission, but donors might also care about other donors and other fundraisers that care about your mission. And being donor centric is about like really like at the heart, getting to know people for what they care about and what matters to them. Yeah, that's really important, the getting to know people and not making assumptions. Cause I know I have definitely been guilty of that in the past of things that are really easy to fall into of like, well, our donors don't care about X or our donors are only interested in Y. And sometimes you base those assumptions on some evidence you've examined and sometimes you're just kind of freewheeling and you might be wrong. Um, but I think like starting to get to really know on a personal level what people care about and what motivates them is the key to being able to speak to their interests and passions. And it's interesting, I've been thinking about like, we often ask like, what do donors want? What do they like? What is, how do I get donors to give to me? Which is again, like you were saying, Scott, really a mindset shift of uh, my Valentine's metaphor lately has been like asking what do donors want is equivalent to asking what do women want? And the answer is depends on the person, right? It's a different, it's going to be different no matter who it is. So the key is finding those ways to start getting that information about your donors so that you can speak to their interests and passions and care. So how do we do that at scale, Scott? Excellent. Well, you know what? And before I talk about that, and I know that's why I'm here, but I want to mention there's two things that I've seen coming up in the chat, and, and I, I wanted to talk to both of them. So one was that uh, I referred to Mackenzie Scott's money as Jeff Bezos' money. It's obviously not, but I know that everybody kind of makes the connection of Mackenzie Scott to Jeff Bezos. I wanted to make sure everybody was, was following us on the ride. Um, and the other thing that's really important, and uh, I think a couple people have mentioned this, Stephen was the first one I saw mention this, was that what we're talking about here, this, this shift in communication doesn't just impact what I do to, uh, you know, to 
bring in gifts or to acquire donors. Part of this is what happens after that donation. Um, you know, thanking a donor and showing donor love, like thank you is important, but again, thank it implies I asked you for something and, and you did it, right? Instead, it's, hey, I have an opportunity for us to partner together to make a difference. You supply the money, we supply the infrastructure. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna thank them, but I also want to make sure I'm reporting the impact of their gift, right? Hey, you wanted to make a difference. I told you we would make a difference. Look at the difference that we made together, right? Following up and reporting on impact is really important. Now, doing this at scale requires a couple of things, right? Brian mentioned, you know, hey, I need to know what's important to all of my donors. Why are they giving? Well, I need to make sure I can capture that, right, in an important way. And um, Linda, good taste. Thank you for noticing my TARDIS in the background. Um, important things. But um, I need to make sure that I'm capturing those data points. I need to make sure that I'm capturing the motivation. I'm capturing what messaging people respond to, and I'm storing that in my database, whatever database I'm using. Man, Doctor Who fans coming out. Whatever database I'm using, if it is virtuous or anything else, I need to make sure I'm storing that data so that I can use that actionably whenever I'm reaching out to them, right? And then when we talk about doing this at scale, we talk about doing this for major donors, that's easy. I'm gonna sit down with Brian and take him to lunch. Right now I'm gonna send him DoorDash and we're gonna hang out on Zoom and have lunch, but same idea. And I'm gonna to get to know him really well. But if I can do this for all of my donors, I, there's, there's really no reason now with all the tools out there that I can't capture this information with any donation, store it on someone's record and send them some type of automated communication follow-up by email, by mail, by text message, whatever it is, to keep that communication going with them after the fact. And so the key is to make sure that I'm leveraging those technologies to do that for donors at every level, the same way I would want to make sure I do that for the folks who are making those major gifts. Absolutely. And I think if we think about it in terms of major gifts of this is a thing we already know how to do. It's just a question of now, how do we do it for everybody? And the answer is some kind of tools. Oh yes, and to clarify, uh, Charlotte and anyone else who wanted to know, the kind of information we're talking about could be what donors, what resonates with them, what um, specific programs they're interested in, what kind of emails they get before they actually go through and make a gift versus the kinds of emails they don't open, a whole lot of things. Can you speak more to some of those donor signals, Scott or Brian? Anyone can comment on this. Yes, sorry, I'm, there's still more Doctor Who jokes going on. So I know, I'm getting really a, Yeah, that chat is a whole other thing. Um, uh, but what you said, and then Brian will have another story that makes me look bad again. But um, yes, it's it's capturing data points. So what is the channel that I'm using to communicate with them? So what channel do they prefer to communicate via? I want to know that. So I know, okay, what's the best way to communicate with them? Do they tend to respond more to direct mail or to email, um, you know, to social media? Because, okay, great. Then I know that I want to do more of that for them. Um, what is the particular campaign or initiative that, that spurred them to give in the first place? What is the program that they are supporting, right? What project or program are they funding? What is their gift designated to or restricted for? Great, that's gonna tell me what is their passion. If I have lots of different things, uh, programs that I do and one of them is education for, um, for kids, are they always giving to my educational programs? Because I wanna talk to them more about that then. And when I have other new education programs, I want them to, uh, to support them as well, right? Um, the more that I can start to capture those data points and store them on a record, the easier it is for me to then use that in segmentation and to use that in some of my you know, broader communication out to those donors. Sorry, my dog's going crazy in the background. So I'll let Brian swoop in. Yeah, I think I, I actually want to surface a resource. It's something that Virtuous has been talking a lot about recently. Uh, we partnered with Next After to conduct a study on the state of multi-channel donor communications. And it's a free download. And like the big takeaway that I want to say is if you're commuting through communicating through multiple channels to offline and offline donors, the lifetime value increase is three times lifetime value. Um, it's an incredible report with really great insights. I'm almost, I can drop it into the chat here for people. 
Um, but, you know, what I want to surface is like really, you know, just to back up what Scott's saying, you know, with data and research in this study is that when we reach donors through multiple channels, through email, social media, text, handwritten notes, um, you name it, you know, we're increasing engagement and it also is proven to increase retention. And only 3% of nonprofits are utilizing multi-channel donor communications. Um, and, you know, we, we had a conversation earlier this week and someone asked the question of, well, at what point is too, many, too much communication a bad thing? And I'd, I'd almost surface that, you know, we wanna be creating several non-ask touch points through the process through various methods that again, help donors feel more intimately connected to us, but also just more intimately connected to the impact that they're making with us as a partner. Um, and so that's a great study. I'm gonna drop it here in the, here in the chat now. Thanks, Brian. I saw a question come up about um, processes for recurring or monthly donors. Like what does donor love and centricity look like in that kind of situation? Oh, look, we've got two of those. That's awesome. Um, I, I think the big thing is I need to have one sort of stream of content and communication for folks who give, you know, a, a single gift or a one-off gift. I want to wrap them in all kinds of love and thanks and tell them about the impact. And for those recurring donors, we tend to kind of forget about them. Like we celebrate when they make the recurring commitment. So when we get them to be a new monthly donor, we tend to go all out and say, thank you. And by month six, we kind of go, well, I feel bad. I don't want to send them uh, communication every month. They don't need that for me. Well, I, I, I don't know that. A, I want to make sure that I send them at least a little thank you every time to say, hey, man, we it's been a year and a half and we still appreciate you just as much as we ever did. And I also wanna make sure that they're getting recurring updates on whatever it is that they're donating to or supporting, right? I need to communicate that impact. The, the cadence is gonna be different for them, but I wanna make sure that I'm still providing them those updates to say, hey, that, that money that you don't even think about every month anymore, that is still making a huge difference and we're doing so much good together. And here's what that looks like. And so that could mean that every quarter I'm getting my recurring donors an update from the field, right? And then every gift that comes in is at least getting a small thank you, even if it's just an email, even if it's something small that says, hey, you're still awesome. And I wanna make sure that I keep doing that uh, over time. Oh, look at that. Someone else just mentioned that they have a calendar for reaching out to their monthly donors. So they have a six month check in. They celebrate their anniversaries. Celebrating milestones like anniversaries is great anytime that you can do that. And again, if you've got the right software, I know a good one. Um, you can do that automatically. I don't know. It starts, it starts with a V, ends with an S. Um, but yeah, there are great ways to be able to celebrate those things for your recurring donors too. Yeah, I see someone else in the chat was saying that they're planning to edit their autoresponder each month so that you're not the donors aren't getting the same identical monthly email, which sounds like a great idea to me. Um, and that's the thing with automation is it doesn't have to be like we set it up, we forget it forever, and it just goes on. You can tweak things as it goes to personalize even more. You can play with it. You have options. The robots do not control your life. They are there to help you. Uh, somebody raised a question that I've definitely encountered before and I would love if someone could speak to. Texting donors, is it annoying? How can it be done in a successful way that isn't annoying? Well, number, I, I'm just, Brian's nodding and I, I you, don't let me start talking, I won't stop. Um, Thank you, brother. But, there you go. The first thing is you, you need to make sure with texting, um, ask them if it's okay to text them. Right? You're going to collect their phone number from somewhere, and when you do, you want to make it clear up front, hey, can we text you on this number? Great example. I don't get text messages for most services I sign up for because I'm an old curmudgeon, and I don't do that sort of thing. My wife gets text messages from everything she signs up for and has all kinds of automated alerts coming in. Her preference would be text her because she does everything on her phone. My preference would be email me and I will certainly read your message or I will answer you. So, you know, you want to talk about donor love and donor centricity, just ask them first and foremost, hey, how do you want to hear from us? And of course, if you're going to text them anything, and that first text message might be when you text them to say thank you for the first gift they've made, that text message has to have an opt-out in it, 
so that they can reply and say, please don't do this again. Great. Okay. Right. Uh, Multi-channel doesn't mean I hit you on every channel all the time. It just means I've got multiple channels available. And if you say, no, I prefer this one, or I don't like that one, great. I'll make sure I don't do that. But texting does feel um, a lot more personal, right? That Because that's how we talk to our friends. And the language on a text is very different. It shouldn't sound like an email. It should sound like a human being with two thumbs banged out. Hey, thank you so much. You've made such a great difference and we're so glad to have you on board. Nothing really more than that. Yeah, and I'd reinforce that by saying that, you know, I think off, oftentimes when I get text messages from nonprofits, I see an overwhelming amount of donation asks with a link to donate. And I would flip the switch and say, you know, tread carefully and, and, you know, when you start with text, you know, maybe the, maybe the first text that a donor needs to receive is a, a really wonderful thank you. And maybe the thing that you're linking to is, you know, maybe, uh, maybe for, if it's a recurring donor, you have a, a very specific tailored landing page for recurring donors um, that highlights impact and has a video story or, you know, something that engages that's meaningful that shows the impact. So, you know, don't overutilize text just to always be sending donation asks. Use it to create meaningful engagement and start a conversation. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of, of hard and fast rules, um, but I know that there are some people who use sort of like a three to one rule where like, hey, um, for every one message that a donor or a prospect receives that's an ask, they should get three more where the call to action is not give us your money. Right. They should get three more that are just aimed at thanking them or letting them know about the importance of your mission or, or something else. Um, and it's not to say that those communications can't have a way for them to give. Right. If I send an email somewhere in there, there should be a button that lets you give if you like. I'm not going to say no, but the explicit purpose of my communication is not this is an appeal. Right now, do you have to be like okay, three to one, and we've got to balance our calendar of communication? Like, I, I, I don't love that idea. And again, that that implies one size fits all. But keeping that that sort of framework in mind, that they should be hearing from you more about the impact of their donation and the impact of the work than they are. Please give us your money. That's kind of a, a good basic guideline. Mm. I love that. I also. Um... I saw a question come through in the chat from Sandy that I wanted to speak to. And you know, Sandy asked, you know, how about a short video email? Do those work? And I just wanted to speak quickly to the power of video, you know, and we're living in a really unique time where people have become like so used to being on, on video now, just through Zoom and through the pandemic. And it's also just a way just to be a little bit more real and authentic. And video doesn't have to be as, I think as polished as we thought that it used to be. And, you know, I think there's a lot of power in utilizing video in email to be able to give really personal updates um, at scale. I'd also encourage that there are other ways that you can get creative around using video. You know, something that I used to do with one of the founders of, of an organization I worked at is I had an hour with him every week and we would sit down for an hour and we would crank out 30 you know, two minute videos of him calling out a donor by name and thanking them. And then he would let me log into his personal Facebook account. And we post that video to all of those donors, personal, you know, Facebooks from his account. And like the joy and excitement that people got from getting this like hyper personalized, really real, just him at his desk engagement was really, really meaningful. And it helped donors and supporters feel more connected to our cause. So I'd say that there are ways that you can use video to get creative. And there's also ways that you can use video at scale um, that really helps people feel more connected to you. And love that question. I don't know if you have anything to add, Scott. Well, and the other thing for video, getting the executive director on video is awesome, right? But if you can uh, also, if you have a good enough relationship with your program staff that you can get folks from the field who are going to do those videos, if you have beneficiaries of your services who want to do those videos, those are, are even more powerful a lot of times, right? Because that's going back to the original, I'm someone with money and I want to make a difference in the world. That's the difference I wanted to make. Those are the people who are on the ground doing it or on the ground benefiting it from it. And that I, I love to be able to see. It's also sometimes a lighter ask for your program staff and um, constituents if you 
say, I want to shoot like a one minute, 30 second video than to be like, hey, program staff, can you write up a story from the field for me to update me? Which is like, they're busy people. And this is sometimes hard when you're in development to get those stories. Whereas if you say like, I want to come down with my iPhone and my notepad and take a video for 30 seconds. Do you have 30 seconds? It can be better for some folks. Oh golly, we're almost to the end of the time already, which always happens. And I still feel like there's so much more to put into this conversation. Last flurry of questions, chat. I really encourage everyone to look things over. There are people who are doing great things to show the donor love. As always, we would love to hear about it here at Virtuous, what you're doing, what's working. I see oh, someone says they send out a 90 second video from their president and vice president every three weeks with impact stories and also from their partners. That sounds great. People are walking around their office taking video, um, writing monthly mission stories to send in their thank you letters and some monthly recurring donors have opt in, opted in to the point that someone collects the letters. You never know what's gonna be the thing that really resonates for a donor. I mean, I would say you can look at your data and have a good idea of what might, but there's always gonna be something that you're like, oh, for that person, it was this story, it was that thing. So I encourage everyone to keep trying stuff. Yeah, and there's a lot of this, you know, the same Instagram and Facebook video, which is great. And to, you know, everybody's point, it, it doesn't, Brian mentioned, it doesn't have to be super produced. And especially again, if it's someone who's in the field and they're just holding up their phone and doing the quick, you know, 90 second talk to the screen thing, that's great. And that's authentic. And that's kind of what I want to see. And being able to use that on social media and to send that out to some of your supporters, that's really powerful. We have one client where they have their whole staff a couple times a year. Every, doesn't matter what your job is at the nonprofit. Everybody stops and makes thank you calls to donors. Everybody, right? It doesn't matter who you are. And that benefits in a couple ways. The donors get that attention. And it also keeps the whole organization connected to the donors. Even the people who are removed sometimes really get to talk to the people who are making stuff happen. The more you can do stuff like that, the better. Well, thank you both, Brian and Scott, for joining us today. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on your busy Thursday. I'm just going to go ahead and assume it was a busy Thursday because you're a bunch of fundraisers. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next week, same time, same station, at the Responsive Weekly. Have a great week, everybody. See you next week. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye.